needed an economic boost. It was a small town and they were having problems. Uh, most of the farms were small ones, less than 100 acres, and this was the only part of the economy that was faring very well. Businesses in Dayton were quite pressed. A blast furnace had employed nearly a thousand men had shut down in 1913, so it cut that company payroll of about $50,000 a month to nothing. Well, that's devastating for an economy the size of Dayton's. Its population had declined from about 3,000 in the 1890s to fewer than 1,800 by July of 1925. In Dayton, I deeply suspect the real issue was not evolution. The issue was Dayton. The trial was an unabashed ruse to promote a declining economy. Well, a few local citizens contrived the event in the drugstore of F.E. Robinson, who was also the head of the County Board of Education. And it was there that Robinson and George Rapelier, a mining engineer who oversaw 400 men for the uh, Cumberland Coal Company, and Walter White, the county superintendent of schools, were arguing in May of 1925 about evolution. Rapelier, the non-native of the bunch, he was from New York, by the way, uh, took the pro-evolution side. He was a bit antagonistic toward Dayton and Tennesseans generally, I believe. Well, when the argument resumed a day later, they asked John Scopes to come to the drugstore. And he had recently graduated from the University of Kentucky, and he taught science and coached football at Dayton. So Scopes is drawn into this argument, and he points out that no one could teach biology without teaching evolution. That's what Rapelier had been waiting to hear. He springs into action. He told Scopes that he'd been breaking the law and he showed Scopes a news item about the ACLU's offer to help defend a test case. Rapelier said, quote, that will make a big sensation, end quote. Scopes didn't like the idea of being arrested and he believed that the Bible and evolution could be reconciled. He finally relented and agreed to get himself arrested. And later, he called it a drugstore discussion that got past control. So the ACLU lived up to its end of the agreement. And they agreed to help. Scopes was arrested on May 7th. And the townspeople sprang into action. They organized a Scopes Trial Entertainment Committee. I think that sums it up pretty well. That's, <laughs> that was their view of the trial. It wasn't about evolution. This was going to be a carnival. It was going to bring some people into town. We were going to have some fun, rev things up a little bit. And they were supposed to do just what they said. They were going to accommodate visitors and uh, organize some entertainment. So as the trial nears, the town starts to adorn shop windows with pictures of apes and monkeys. The constable's motorcycle was cruising around with a Monkeyville police sign on it. Robinson's drugstore was serving up simian sodas. I'm not sure what was in the concoction, but uh, they were offered. And the progressive Dayton Club even approved $5,000, this is $5,000 in 1925 money, to promote town businesses during the trial. Well, that's extremely important. And I think it's important to this day to keep those little humorous details in mind because that's what the trial really was, at least for Dayton. The trial itself. The trial itself legally was inconsequential. Symbolically though, so they are a wonderful contrast to bring into the courtroom. What Darrow saw here was a wonderful opportunity to debunk Christianity. And he later wrote that his intention was to focus the nation on Bryan and fundamentalism. You notice he doesn't mention John Scopes and concern about John Scopes' welfare. The ACLU was worried about this. They thought that Darrow was going to alienate people. They were trying to figure out how to get him out of the picture. But he was too powerful, too well known, and they couldn't do it. But his militant agnosticism in particular bothered them. The ACLU was not hostile to religion per se. They didn't like the idea of religion being taught in schools. Pretty much the same agenda now. 
But Darrow wanted in the fight. And when he volunteered to help defend Scopes, by the way, that was the only time in his life that he offered services for free. He did like the idea of a spectacle, of a street brawl, if you will, with Brian. He wanted this sensational fight between science and religion. That's exactly how he wanted to frame it. And he spent his life, in fact, ridiculing Christianity in the courtroom, on the Chautauqua circuit, in public debates and lectures, in books and in articles for popular audiences. The other man, Brian, well, history, historians, I guess I should take some blame, uh, we oftentimes diminish losers. Brian was an individual of substance. I think the Scopes trial really hurt his legacy very badly. But we forget that he was a three-time presidential candidate for the Democratic Party in 1896, 1900, and 1908. Each time he got 45 to 48 percent of the vote. So he lost convincingly, but still an individual of substance. And he was Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. This is not a country preacher coming from out of the woods somewhere suddenly to show himself uh, for a show trial. No, it is a national figure of substance. And what we have left, I think, is the image from Inherit the Wind, all too often, where he's a fool, uh, a fundamentalist fool at that, that also doesn't reflect his religious position very well. But more on that later. His attacks on evolution and he had made attacks on evolution, had pretty much established him by spring of 1921 as a national leader of anti-evolutionists. And he focused on what he called the speculative nature of evolution. He also set the agenda for fundamentalism by helping to define it as anti-evolutionism and not so much the biblical literalism which is played up in too many places and probably overplayed to a great extent. If you examine his testimony closely in that famous exchange when he's on the stand and Darrow is grilling him, he doesn't defend biblical literalism. He's trying to dodge it. He's trying to get around it, but he's in the impossible spot of trying to say that Genesis is true, but it's not true in seven, 24, seven days, 24-hour periods. He can't do it, not with Darrow. Darrow doesn't let him do that. But Brian said that Darwin's theory was simply a hypothesis, a scientific synonym for a guess. He also said the theory lacked incontrovertible evidence. And he said that scientists hadn't documented a single instance of one species changing into another. I point that out because it's illustrative. That alone shows that Brian shouldn't have been there. He was out of his league. He doesn't know what a theory is. Of course, some of our legislators in this day and age don't understand what a theory is. It is not a synonym for a guess. And evolution, in particular Darwin's theory of the fact of evolution, natural selection, doesn't say that one species will change into another one at any point. And incontrovertible evidence Science is not incontrovertible. When it becomes incontrovertible, now we have religion. So that, again, points up, I think, Brian's problems here. 